So proud of you. Thank you so much, students, for being with us this morning. Have you been blessed already today? I tell you what, if you, if you haven't been blessed, your blessers busted, right? That's for sure. Thank you for honoring our veterans. Thank you for representing your school and your generation so well. You know, so often we, uh, we hear <clears throat> nothing but negative about young people. And I was so proud. So proud. <clears throat> Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Let me get into the message before I totally break down, all right? You know, every four years in our nation, we are subjected to all of the campaign promises of presidential candidates and all the promises of how they're going to improve our country and how life is going to be different in our world when they get elected. And, you know, fortunately, sometimes uh, the most comforting thing is, is that once they get in office, they forget the campaign promises that, uh, that come along. But, you know, I'm not going to get political up here, but all I'm saying is, is that we hear these promises about what's going to happen. You know, as we look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was coming into the world as the promised Messiah, the king that would come and reign. And as at the very beginning of his uh, ministry, he preached a sermon that outlined the qualities of the kingdom that he was going to rule over. We call that the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest recorded sermon in the Word of God that goes from Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7 in your Bible. And uh, as Jesus began to talk about this kingdom, he, he started, he introduced his message with eight qualities of his eight qualities that his kingdom people would demonstrate. He's, he didn't come to just change things politically. He came to change things personally in people's lives. And the change would come because the change came to people's lives. You know, we say, God bless America. Amen. Amen. But you know, what we need to do is pray that God will bless Americans and that Americans will be changed because when Americans are changed, our nation will change. There's nothing that's wrong with our country that a good old fashioned revival wouldn't straighten out. And uh, we need that kind of miracle in our lives. And so Jesus began with these eight qualities. He introduced this message, and he got people's attention because the very first word that came out of his mouth was blessed, makaros. And uh, we said last week that it is not quite sufficient to say that that word just means happiness. That's probably one of the closest equivalents we have in the English language uh, to that word that it is about happiness. But as we explained last week, and since some of you were not here last week, let me explain it very, very quickly if I can. The word blessed here that he uses in these Beatitudes doesn't just mean happiness in our concept. Our concept here in our country has to do with uh, positive things. Happiness is kind of a shallow emotion. It's based on hap or happenstance. If our happenstance happens to be positive, we're happy. If our happenstance happens to be negative, we're not so happy, right? It can be taken away from us so very quickly. It's a very shallow thing. But what Jesus is talking about is a divine favor that's bestowed upon people that is not affected by the common everyday occurrences of life. In fact, the Greeks use this very sparingly in their literature, when they're writing, when they use this word blessed, and they used it to refer to the gods because the gods lived above all the circumstances of humanity. The things that touch yours and my life didn't touch the gods, so therefore their happiness was preserved. It couldn't be affected. And yet Jesus says to us that his kingdom citizens will be blessed. They will have divine favor that the normal things and uh, occurrences in this life will not affect. 
And so he didn't say that just once, he said it eight different times, actually nine times, but eight qualities that he referred to here in this sermon and in the introduction of this. But these qualities were so different. He got their attention. He said, you want to really have divine favor in your life that things cannot touch, pay attention. And so the very first thing that he said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 3, if you look there, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We looked at this last week, and we said that Jesus was not talking about being poor in pocketbook, but being poor in spirit. In our heart, we realize we are spiritually bankrupt. We have no moral currency with which to influence God. You know, you can't come to God and brag about your accomplishments. All you can come and say, I'm a beggar before God. I need your grace. I need what you have for my life. You see, we're blessed because we realize that no matter what circumstances life throws at us, that we're incapable of handling, God can supply what we need. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. And so when we realize that we are poor in spirit, God then can bless us even in those circumstances. Well, if the first one was tough to hear and understand, the second one was probably twice as hard because it says in verse number four, what we're going to look at this morning is, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is the gladness of sadness. This really would go counter to that day as it would in our day. We don't like to think about sadness. We don't want somebody to say, you know, if I'm elected, if I'm in control, you're going to go through some sadness in your life. We don't want to hear that, do we? We want to know that everything's going to be up and positive, but those sadnesses come. And, you know, we live in a world that strives to laugh away every hurt, drown every sorrow, take a pill for every pain, and the idea that a person who is visited by grief could be blessed is, well, honestly, it's weird to think that Jesus is promising that mourning would bring blessing to our life. In fact, it's so foreign and counterintuitive to us that even the followers of Christ uh, in many ministries today promote faith through what we call prosperity preachers, the joy boys, you know, the happy clappy crowd. And, you know, just, you know, trust Jesus and your life is going to always be sweet and roses and everything's going to be positive. Well, Jesus never made that promise. He said, in this life, you will have tribulation. You are going to have problems. But God can transform those things in our life. So don't, first of all, don't get me wrong or Jesus this morning. There's an appropriate time to laugh according to the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon. He wrote in the book of Proverbs that laughter does good like a medicine, right? And around here, some people are over-medicated, I know. <laughs> I've run into you. But here's the truth. What a person laughs at and when they laugh can reveal a lot about their character. What people laugh at and when they laugh at it can reveal a lot about their character. Far too much laughter today is based on things that should make us blush and many things that once made us weep. If you'll watch comedies, you know, situation comedies and comedy movies and that, you'll find that there's a lot of jokes made about things that are really not that funny. And yet we've made a big joke of it, trying to laugh away the pain. <clears throat> Our Lord is not a killjoy. He's not a, you know, cosmic party poop that wants to destroy all our fun. In fact, he said in John chapter 15, verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. He wants his joy to remain. It's that divine blessed and blessedness that he wants to give to us uh, through his beatitudes. And, and I hope you'll be able, I'll be able to show you this morning that fullness of joy doesn't come out, come to our life until we've had an encounter with godly sorrow in our life. 
First of all, we need to understand the reality of sorrow in this life. You know, sorrow does come to this world. This was a hard message for me to begin to prepare because I've been through the valley with many of you. Some it's been the death of a loved one. Some it's been a problem with a child or in a relationship, maybe through loss of a job. And I've been through some sorrow with some of y'all. And I don't want this to sound like a cheap uh, answer, quick answer. This is something profound that Jesus wants in our heart and life for us to get a hold of. Not all sorrow in life is exactly alike. And we can't say that it's all universally blessed. A fact that Paul makes clear when he wrote a letter to the Corinthians, he wrote this. Fellas, do we have that scripture up? Okay. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, he had written a previous letter in which he really confronted them about some things that were wrong in their life and in the church. And he got really blunt about it and called them out. And he said, for though I made you sorry with a letter, he wrote that and it caused many of them discomfort and, and weeping in their life because of what he wrote about. He said, I do not repent. I don't take it back. Though I did repent, now, what does he mean by that? Well, I've been there as a preacher. I've preached some things from this pulpit, and I've told the truth about behavior and about what happens when you disobey God, and I've said some things from this pulpit. And Maybe the first thing that went through my mind, or at least by lunchtime, I'm thinking, I shouldn't have said that. You know, I could tell how it hit people. I could see that people, some people were upset, and I was thinking, I shouldn't have said that. But as I thought about it, I thought, no, I should have said that. That's what should have been said. And that's exactly what Paul's saying. I said, I don't take it back. Though at first, I thought about it and thought, maybe I, maybe I spoke too quickly. He said, I did repent. But then he goes on and he says, for I perceive or I understand that the same epistle, the same letter, has made you sorry, though it were but for a season, just for a little while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness, what concern it wrought in you, Yea, what clearing of yourself. You got things cleaned up in your lives. Yea, what indignation. You began to hate sin as, as you got it cleaned up out of your life. You know, when you're tolerating your life, you'll tolerate a lot of sin. But when you start getting it out of your life, then you don't want it anymore. He said, what indignation, what fear, what meaning there, what reverence in your life. Yea, what vehement desire you have, the zeal. Yea, what revenge. In other words... When you saw it in other people and you saw others disrespecting God, it got your, you in a spirit where you wanted to call it out. In all things, you have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. In other words, because you received this and you wept over it, he says, now your life is different. It's been improved because of this. Paul contrasts two very different types of sorrow in this passage of Scripture. He talks about the sorrow of the world that destroys and godly sorrow that leads to repentance. One is positive and the other is deadly. You know, as with all emotions, sorrow is a gift of God. God's given you your emotions, amen? Sometimes we think that our emotions are something to be suppressed, something to, to cover up. But God gave us emotions and thank God that he did. And... Uh, but just as these emotions can be warped, love can be twisted into lust, anger can mutate into blind hatred, sorrow can become a destructive attitude in our life. It'll help us if we understand and differentiate between three types of sorrow that we experience in life. Let me just real quickly go through these. First of all, there's natural sorrow. This comes about because of the situations in life. You know, the irony of life is that the things in life that give us the greatest pleasure may also be the source of our greatest sorrow. Marriage, children, friendships, 
those things that we open ourselves up to because they bring joy to us. You know, people can get married and have the greatest joy. I've been here at this altar and seen couples exchange their vows in one of the happiest times of their life. But then something's happened to one of the spouses. Maybe it's a terminal illness or something else, and that sorrow just comes in because somebody so precious has is suffering in their life. I've seen parents so happy and so joyful. Grandchildren, there's nothing better than grandchildren, I believe. But if they get off track and they begin to make bad choices in their life, it can bring great sorrow into our heart. Friendships can be so comforting. And yet, if a friend betrays you, there's no pain quite like it in your life. You know, the, the gaining these things brings joy. The absence of them can bring sorrow in our life. Really, the only way to ensure never experiencing pain of natural sorrow in our life is to live in a bubble and never touch others or let them touch you. But that's not really living, is it? That's no way to live. God's given us the emotion of sorrow as a relief valve that helps us to accept pain and work through grief as it vents emotional poison from our system. If you keep it bottled up, you're going to have problems. I once attended a seminar by a nationally recognized grief counselor. His name was Alan Wolfeld. In fact, he was a man that Buckingham Palace contacted when Princess Diana was killed, and they wanted to know how to properly have a public display of grief for her and what to do, you know, as far as allowing the public to express their grief. And uh, he, was, he was contacted by them. As I listened to him, he explained the purpose of grief and mourning in our funeral traditions. Grief is the pain that we feel inwardly. Mourning is how we express it outwardly. When we're going through mourning, we're expressing it outwardly. Our ancestors understood that there needed to be an opportunity to work through these feelings and develop, and therefore they developed the funeral traditions as outlets for this, this pain. Today, we ignore those things to our own detriment. We live in a world today that's moving so fast, we say, well, we don't want to take time for a funeral. We want to rush through this. We won't, don't want to take proper time to mourn this. And when we do, we're not fully accepting the situation and working through it. And so sometimes we do more damage by trying to ignore it than we do in facing it. Tears are neither sinful nor a sign of weakness. You know, I hear some people say, well, don't cry. You know, somebody's lost a loved one, we're in a funeral home, they'll tell that person, don't cry. Well, that's stupid advice. I'm sorry, that's not the right thing to say from the pulpit. <laughs> But I don't repent, I should say it, right? <laughs> it's, it's stupid advice to tell somebody not to cry because God gave those tears for a purpose, to work that out and to adjust to these things. It's right. Paul said, we sorrow not as others who have no hope. We sorrow, but not as others who have no hope. There is sorrow when we have a loss in our life, and so that's perfectly normal and natural for us to experience that. And it's not a matter of weakness. Well, I'm a man, I don't cry. And, you know, some guys have this idea that to be John Wayne Tough or whatever, Vin Diesel or whoever you want to put the rock, you know, <laughs> I don't cry. But, you know, even Jesus wept. Even Jesus wept. In fact, the shortest verse in the Bible. We can all memorize a verse right now, all right? John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept, right? Now, you got that? You can go home and say, I've memorized a whole scripture today during a pastor's message, all right? You say, well, that's, man, that's such a short verse. Yeah, but it is packed. What meaning is in those two words? Jesus wept. The God-man came into our world, and he experienced that grief in his heart at the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus wept. You know, when you're crying and when you're shedding tears, understand that God understands that. God knows your tears. In fact, the Bible says he keeps your tears in a bottle. God knows how many tears you've cried, and he keeps them in a bottle. He knows what hurts in your life, and he's aware of it, and he's experienced pain 
and mourning in, in the flesh when he was here walking our earth. So that's natural sorrow. Natural sorrow comes because of the situations in life, those things that come at us sometimes unexpectedly. You know, we interrupt this period of happiness in your life with a special bulletin, here comes pain. And we experience that pain in our life. But just as there's natural sorrow, there's also unnatural sorrow. This is the sorrow of the world, as Paul points out in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. There's a sorrow of the world that worketh death. You know, that you've, you've experienced, you've been around somebody who's gone through something, and it seems like their, their grief is exaggerated, that it's amplified. And the problem with that kind of grief is that it doesn't, do something positive in our life, it, it actually works the opposite way. Instead of making us better, often it makes us bitter in our life. It doesn't lead us to lean into God. We begin to pull away from God because of the hurt, and, and we refuse to be comforted in our life. It makes the wounds deeper. Now, there are several causes for unnatural sorrow, reasons that people vent that way and go that direction. One is selfishness. Selfishness. Our lifestyle, because of some loss, has been upset, interrupted, or our goals have been denied. You know, we don't, we're not getting things our way. This is not my plan. This, is, this makes my life uncomfortable. It's all about me in this uh, situation. <clears throat> There's an example of that in the scriptures. There was an evil king in the Bible by the name of Ahab who looked out his window one day, and he saw a vineyard next to his castle or his palace, and it was being tended by a man named Naboth. It was his family heritage, his vineyard, and Naboth wanted that, or Ahab wanted that vineyard. He thought, it'd be nice, it'd be convenient. I could have a salad every day for lunch, you know, if I had that vegetable garden. So he went over and he made an offer to Naboth. He says, I want to buy your vineyard. I'll give you another piece of ground just as good for it. And Naboth said, I can't sell this. This is my family's inheritance. I cannot sell this. I will not. And so Ahab, when he couldn't have what he wanted, went home and pouted. He turned his head, his face to the wall, and he pouted. Now, Jesus didn't say, blessed are those that moan. He said, blessed are those that mourn, right? Some of us are moaning about how unfair life is and about how how shortchanged we got in life. And we make a matter of moaning instead of mourning. So some of, some of the unnatural sorrow is due to selfishness because we're not getting our way or what we want and life is not going the way we want it to go. Then there's fear. Fear comes in when, when something happens in our life that takes our happiness, we get afraid. What does the future hold? Sometimes it's the very fact of death itself that is so fearful to us. And the fear builds in people's lives, and, and they become afraid of what is going to happen next. And that excessive grief almost comes to them like a shield. They, they begin to build this grief up in their life, and, and it's like they're saying, hey, don't, don't lay anything else on me. Don't, don't bother me with anything else. Can't you see how much I'm hurting right now? I can't handle anything else, so they, they put that out there to keep you from, you know, approaching them about any responsibility or going on with life. And then, one that I've seen far too often is a matter of guilt. People have excessive sorrow because they're trying to somehow emotionally atone for something that they've done or some lack. You know, people have a loved one pass away and maybe it's a parent's had a child or you've had a parent pass away or it's a brother or sister, some acquaintance of yours, and your relationship wasn't what it should be when they passed away and you have that feeling of guilt in your life that something is, was wrong and I didn't get to get it right. And maybe if I just mourn a little extra hard, I can make things right. You know, that, that, that over... Uh, demonstration of grief is actually a penance that people are trying to do. We see that, ironically, in the life of David. 
David, we all know that he committed a terrible sin of adultery with Bathsheba, and then to cover that up, he actually caused the murder of a very faithful man. And God said as a result of that in his life, there was going to be tragedy that would visit on his family. And sure enough, his son Absalom became a very rebellious young man, and David did not function probably if you do a study of David's life and his parenting. He wasn't the dad he should have been in Absalom's life. He didn't correct him as he should have on occasions. He didn't do what he should have done to mentor Absalom. And Absalom became a rebel and caused his father to actually become a fugitive and have to flee uh, from the palace. And it caused a civil war in the country as those that sided with David went with him and those that were with Absalom went with him. And during one of those battles of that civil war, Absalom was killed. And David went into excessive grief. And it's one of the most poignant verses of scripture where David begins to cry when he hears that his son Absalom is dead. He says, Absalom, oh Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom, would to God that I had died for thee, Absalom, oh Absalom, my son. And as you read that passage of scripture, you can almost hear the grief coming out of David's heart. And part of that is due to the fact that David knew that he had not been the father to Absalom that he should have been. And so he was trying to atone for that lack of parenting by his excessive grief. Well, there's natural sorrow. There's unnatural sorrow that really is excessive. But then there's a godly sorrow. Natural sorrow comes from situations of life, unnatural sorrow from self and sin in our life. But then godly sorrow is a product of the Spirit of God working in our heart and life. Now, just as Jesus was referring to being poor in the Spirit in the first beatitude, I think that following suit, I believe that he's speaking of a deeper dimension of sorrow here when he talks about mourning. I think he's talking about not just the natural sorrow, but I think he's talking about a godly sorrow, a, a sorrow that will lead to repentance, as Paul referred to it to the Corinthians, that works repentance. In our language, in church ease that we speak, we talk about being under conviction. We don't talk about that a whole lot in modern Christianity, but that's not a bad concept. There's a conviction that the Holy Spirit works in our heart and life. We begin to have a godly mourning over sin in our life. And it's not when the Spirit works in our hearts, it's not over the reversals of life, but it's over rebellion towards God that has caused many of the pains that we have. You know, it's not mere regret, nor is it remorse. It's not regret, nor is it remorse. Those are produced by the consequences. When I mentally acknowledge that I have done wrong, it is a mere regret that for what my sins have done to me. Then it goes beyond emotional response. That's remorse. That's for what my sins may have done to others. Produced a, it produced consequences. I'm not just sorry about the consequences of my sin. I'm sorry that I sinned. And there is actually a big difference between those because it, proper and godly sorrow goes to the will and produces confession and, turn, and in turn true repentance for what my sins have done to God. You see, when you sin, you're sinning against God. That's why when David confessed his adultery to Bathsheba, he cried out, he prayed, and he said, against thee, God, and thee only have I sinned. Well, he'd sinned against Bathsheba, obviously. He'd sinned against the people who trusted him. He'd sinned against her husband by ordering his death. But when David boiled it all down, he says, it really is the biggest offense in my life is that I've sinned against you, God. I've sinned against your commandments, your holy standards. I've sinned against you. And he confessed that. Confession is to say the same thing. There's a verse in the Bible that 
you know, us Baptists use as a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's over in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so when we mess up in our life, we're quick to run over that verse and say, well, if I confess my sin, you know, if I say I've sinned, then God is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. The only problem is we have to understand what true confession is. True confession means that I take the same view and say the same thing about my sin that God says about it. I tend to go lightly on my sins, heavy on everybody else's, but light on my own sins, right? But when I begin to look at it through the lens of God's holiness, I begin to realize that I have sinned against God. And I say the same things about my sin that God says, that they're an abomination. And I confess that, and then he is faithful and just to forgive me. It means that I'm going to turn from my sins. If I say the same thing about my sins, it means that I'm not going to tolerate them. I'm going to turn from them. Repentance is not a word that we hear a whole lot anymore preached on. I've been doing something the last couple of weeks that's really been kind of uh, refreshing to my soul. How many of you have Cirrus radio, satellite radio? Anybody have satellite radio? I would challenge you, listen to channel 460. It's the Billy Graham channel. Billy Graham messages from him 24-7, and out of seven decades of this man's life that he preached the gospel, and it could be random. Some of them are from 1957. Some of them are from 1964. Some are 1978. You know, it just doesn't matter when you pull them out. It's his messages were consistently about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's no wonder that his life made such an impact in our nation. And yet he used this term repentance over and over again, whether he's in Madison Square Garden or wherever he might be, he, was, he would use that word repentance. It means to turn from your sins. It's about being sorry for your sin, but sorry enough to quit. Right? And so godly sorrow brings true repentance. It's a conviction of the Holy Spirit for, for our sin against God. Now, I want to take just a moment and explain the difference between false accusations of the devil and true conviction of the Spirit. You know, some people, you know, will do, just do these spiritual autopsies on themselves all the time. You know, and they'll cut themselves open. They'll keep going over, every, on, over and over things in their life all the time. And uh, if we're not careful, we can spend so much time in introspection that we never get things really right with God. You know, I liked what one guy said. He said, you know, when you sort the garbage in your life and you keep going through your life and sorting out all the garbage in your life, he says, what you end up with is neatly neat piles of garbage. And he said, we need to get rid of those things out of our life and understand they've been taken care of. So there is a difference. The devil comes along and accuses us. In fact, one of his titles is he's the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us of sin that has already been confessed and forgiven. He loves to bring up your past and remind you of your failures. God says that when he forgives our sins, he puts them behind him. And if you compare that with another scripture, it says there's no shadow of turning with him. He doesn't turn around. When he puts it behind him, he's, he's put it out of his mind. He doesn't think about it anymore. So God takes that sin away. And when we keep bringing it up, that's not the Holy Spirit doing that. When we've dealt with it and asked God's forgiveness for it, we don't need to, to uh, keep bringing it up. A fellow told his pastor, he said, Preacher, I have prayed a thousand times for forgiveness on this sin. And the preacher said, well, that's 999 times too many. You know, we need to realize that God forgives those sins, and he places them behind him, and he doesn't look at them anymore. On the other hand, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sins that need to be dealt with. We've not dealt with them. They're in our life, and we've tried to cover them up or excuse them rather than deal with them. And that, in other words, we're trying to sweep them under the rug instead of putting them under the blood of Jesus Christ. 
I think it was Adrian Rogers said this, and it's a good thought. If we try to cover up our sins, God will expose our sins. Be sure your sin will find you out. And God's searchlight will find those sins in your life. However, if we expose those sins before God and we confess them before God, God covers them up. He puts them under the blood and they'll never be seen again. He takes away those sins. Amen? So there is a conviction, a godly sorrow that comes to our life. And we can have four different responses to godly sorrow in our life. The term for mourning that Jesus chose was the deepest word that he could have selected from the vocabulary of his day for this. It meant a soul-shaking anguish that was more than just simple discomfort in our emotions, but it took possession of the whole being and couldn't be hidden. It was evident in the whole life. In other words, it came out. It wasn't something that was covered up, but something that was dealt with. So there are four responses that you can have to godly sorrow. When the Holy Spirit puts his hand on something in your life, you can attempt to deny it and rationalize and justify yourself. You know, the religious crowd of Jesus' day was pretty good at that. They could justify their sins and explain those things away. We compare ourselves among ourselves. Well, yeah, God, I know I've done this, but I'm not as bad as that person over there. But God's not dealing with you about that person's sins. He's dealing with you about your sins in your life. He wants you to deal with those things. We can attempt to deny it. We can accept it and attempt to reform ourselves through our own efforts. Well, I'll just, I'll just be better. I'll turn over a new leaf. I'll be better. But remember, we're poor in spirit. We're bankrupt. We can't do it. We can't do it in our own strength. Or we can admit it and just sink in despair and give up. Well, I can't do it. You know, I can't live this Christian life. I'll just give up. And I've run into a lot of people that have that attitude. They, they think that, you know, there's no way over or out of this sin. I'll just give up. Or the fourth thing is you can confess it and turn to God for his grace and mercy, his comfort in your life. There was a young man that Jesus ta talked about in his illustration of the prodigal son. We know that story. Many of you know that story very well. The prodigal went to his father. He demanded his share of the inheritance. And really, in his language, what he was telling his dad is, Dad, I can't wait for you to die to get what's coming to me. I wish you were dead now. Just give me what's coming to me, and I'm out of here. And he left. And that was total disrespect to his father to do that. It was a shame in the community for him to behave that way. And he left, and he went into a far country. He went to a place that didn't have the same belief systems as his family and his community had. He went to a far country. And there he spent everything he had in a party life. You know, he, he just spent it partying, and he got a bunch of new friends around him as he spent all this money. But when his money ran out, so did his friends. They ran out on him as well. And he ended up having to go to a hog farmer in the area and working for that hog farmer, slopping the pigs, which is real come down for a Jewish young boy, you know, to be down there with all the hogs. And things were so bad that he was not even making enough money to buy a meal because it said he would fain have, he would have even attempted to eat what the hogs were eating. That was how bad his situation was. Now, he was in that situation. He realized he had really messed up. It wouldn't take long in that stinking condition to realize this is not the way life was meant to be, right? So he looked around himself and he said, well, this is not so bad. You know, this hog slop isn't so bad. You know, I can eat this. Move over, Porky. Give me, you know, give me one of those husks. And, you know, he could have just settled into it and rationalized and said, well, you know, this is not such a bad life after all. Or, again, he could have decided that he would get work his way up out of there. Well, one of these days I'll work my way up out of this hog pen. I'll be better. You know, just take a few days and I'll get better and I'll get out of this hog pen. Or he could have just given up, fell down face first in the mud and drowned in the mud next to the hogs. 
If you didn't do any of those three things, the Bible said he did the right thing. He came to himself. He started to think clearly. He said, you know, my dad was really a kind and a loving man. He said, my servants are doing a whole lot better than this, that my dad's servants are doing a whole lot better than I'm doing right down here in this hog pen. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to the Father, and I'm going to confess to him that I've sinned against him, no more worthy to be called his son, and if you'll just make me one of the servants, at least I'll get a warm meal and a nice place to sleep if I'll go back. My dad is a forgiving man, and I'll go back to him. So he did the right thing. He came to himself. He realized where he was. He confessed the situation he was in. He repented because he went back to the Father. And as a result of that, he was received by the Father and forgiven. Now, fellas, if you would, just jump the next slide over to the result of godly comfort in our life. Let me just finish up with this. After we have received the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our life, and God has dealt with us, he will comfort us. When you truly sorrow over sin, God will bring a deeper sense of comfort than anything that this world can offer. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, that God is a God of all comfort. God is not some cosmic bully who wants to torture you. He doesn't make you feel bad about your sins just because he enjoys seeing you squirm. He does it because he wants you to be better in your life. I remember there was a time in my life when I was under some deep conviction in my life. And you say, what about? It's none of your business. It's between me and God, all right? So, but there was a time in my life when I was struggling with some deep conviction in my life. And I felt miserable, but I realized it dawned on me at that moment that God was not doing something to me. He was doing something for me. He didn't want me to be in that sin. He didn't want me to be away from him. He wanted me to be with him and in fellowship with him. And so he brought that into my life. And I realized that conviction is not something that God is doing to us. It's something he does for us in our life. He is a God of all comfort. His anger endures but a moment, Psalm 30, verse 5. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. I don't believe that what Jesus is talking about here is about some future comfort. You know, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. One of the, hang in there. One of these days, you know, the kingdom's coming, and one of these days, God's going to wipe away all tears, which it promises over in the book of Revelation. And they say, you know, you shall be. One of these days, you will be comforted. I don't think it's that sense that Jesus is using the word shall. I think he's using the word shall in the, in the sense of being confident and certain. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's not a future promise. That is right now certain. If you do it, you shall be saved. If you mourn, if you are convicted over your sin in a godly mourning, God will definitely comfort you. He will bring comfort to your life. I believe God makes his comfort available to us in several ways right now. I believe you can have the comfort of God in your life. First of all, it comes through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. In fact, the word here that Jesus uses for comfort is the word paraclete, paracleos, which means to come alongside. Brad, can you come down here for just a minute? I'm going to use you. I don't know if you can hear me if I walk away from the mic, but I'll have to try to be sends his spirit to comfort us. It doesn't mean that he comes to just feel with us and have compassion for us and say, oh, poor Brad, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for you. you know, that's what a lot of us want when we want comfort. We want somebody to come along and say, oh, bless your heart. You poor thing. You're hurting so bad. I'm so sorry for you. 
that's not what it means. It means to come alongside and give strength, to give strength to. Our word comfort comes from com for. For is our fortify and strength with strength. God comes with strength, gives us rest. God doesn't just come along and pat us on the head and say, bless your heart, you poor thing, you. He says, here, let me give you some strength. You can walk, you can endure. Because the Holy Spirit, as the paraclete, as the Holy One that comes alongside, comes alongside us to give us his strength to walk the Christian life. Not only does the Spirit give us comfort in our life and to go through the hard times, God gives us the Scripture. Scripture is a comforter for our life. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime or before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Through the comfort of the Scriptures we have hope. When I read in this book, I find that things that I'm suffering, others have suffered. And I see God was faithful in their suffering to bring comfort to them. You know what? That's a comfort to my heart. There's comfort in the word of God. Not only that, it also tells me that when I've had to say goodbye to a loved one, as some of you have had to do over the past year or a couple of years with all of this pandemic and all these things going on, and you've had to say goodbye to a loved one, we know that death is not the end. We know that we have hope. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen? So there's comfort in the Scripture. There's comfort in the Spirit. And there's also comfort from the saints. Fellow believers are to comfort one another. There should be comfort in the house of God when people come. When we're hurting, we ought to hurt together. We ought to comfort one another. In fact, there are several scriptures. Paul wrote about the fact to the Romans that he was coming to be with them. He says, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Paul says, I would look forward to coming to be with you because when I'm with you, I receive comfort from being there with you. I love being in the house of God with God's people. There's a comfort being among people who believe, who trust the word of God and are, are there for you. Amen. I received great comfort while I was in the hospital and people would let me know, I'm praying for you, preacher. They sent me cards and all kinds of Nice tokens to let me know, texts, and let me know that they were praying for me. That brought comfort to my heart. I wasn't going through it by myself, amen? And as a child of God, we need the family of God. That's why we're not to forsake the gathering together of ourselves as the manner of some is. And so we need one another. And you know, if I read correctly in 2 Corinthians Paul was writing about all the trouble that the church and the Christians were going through. And he says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. In other words, when we're going through something, don't waste it. Because somebody else is going to go through these problems too. God is not as concerned about making you comfortable as he wants to make you comfort-able. All right? Spelled the same, but we break the word up. Comfort-able. Able to comfort others. If you're going through something, God can use that in your life to be a comfort to somebody else. <coughs> so I know it sounds weird, Perhaps what the church needs is a little less shallow laughter and a little more earnest weeping for souls 
and for our own anemic spiritual lives and the pain that sin is reaping on our community and our nation. You see, it's not just about what sin is doing to me, but I also mourn for what sin is doing in the world around me. Does it break your heart? Does it break your heart to turn the news on and to see the pain that people in our world are going through? I see, I see people because of sin in the community and things, maybe it's drug trafficking, maybe it's something else. I see somebody else has died. Another mother is mourning a child that's been the unfortunate victim of a drive-by shooting or something of that nature. It ought to break our heart for the pain that's in our world because of sin. We ought to be broken about that. Today, multitudes are laughing their way into hell, and a lot of churches are clowning around the cross. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be, they definitely will be comforted. Yeah, it's weird, but I remind you, normal isn't working. Right? We need weird. Let's stand together with our heads bowed.